All right, it is five after. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I invite you to turn your cameras on. And if you're not reading to mute yourselves. Um, okay, Caleb has the list and he will say your name and we'll just go through it. Okay, so starting with Senna. Okay. Um, one night, three people met on a hill by a tree. The tree was dark and its branches were wavy. The first one said, are you sure about this? Yes, I am, X, the second replied. The third one said, you are always worrying, but this is the safest time. The cornet can only be stolen tonight. But are you even sure we should steal the cornet, said X. After all, it has the power to destroy stars. I am starting to doubt you, X. Perhaps Q and I should go it alone, said the first thief. I agree with you, Nine, said Q. But we should give X one more chance. And so the three thieves crept down the hill and into the town. Q and Nine were so intent on getting to the church that held the cornet that they, they did not notice a figure standing by a lighted window and when x told them nine only called her a worry war at last they got to the church and q who was the tallest helped the others through the window before hiding behind a bench to keep watch nine said the cornet is in the vault under the altar you will have to pick the lock but i will get the corner they moved the altar x picked the lock and nine climbed through the hole nine came out carrying a silk wrapped bundle X thought it looked ordinary, but was smart enough to keep that to herself. Nine handed the bundle to Q and then climbed out the window, closely followed by X. As the thieves made their way through the sleeping town, they heard someone following them. They began to run and were almost to the, their meeting spot up the hill when Q tripped over a log and dropped the bundle. They turned around and watched the stars explode over the town. Okay, that's great. That's a very fun plot. And indeed, a well-crafted, very tight plot there. So we begin with three thieves, I believe three, nine, Q, and X, who are, uh, they're um, hesitant. W one of them, at least, I believe Q or X, X is hesitant, right? X is hesitant about carrying out the plan. The reason why X is having doubts about the plan to steal the cornic is because that can um, that can destroy stars. So right from the very beginning of the plot, we understand there is an anxiety about destroying the stars. Uh, that the cornic has this ability to to uh, to to disappear stars. Uh, then they proceed to carry out the plan. They go down the hill. They go through the process the whole time X is, is uh, doubtful, hesitant. Um, they steal the cornic and uh, proceed on their way. And as they do, that which was foregrounded at the very beginning of the story comes to pass. And uh, we see a very good example, Senna, of foreshadowing when the cornic does indeed, uh, uh, it kind of does its own thing, malfunctions, the thieves cannot control it, and it annihilates the stars, the town thus losing its stars. So I'm, I'm thinking that you chose the image Starry Night, and that the stars yes, in the sky, yeah, the stars in the sky are in fact exploding stars, not merely shining, but on the verge of destruction, um, which is why they look so beautiful in that painting. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. It's really imaginative and, and very uh, well-structured plot. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Senna. Um, reading next is Jackson. Okay. The cold dampness of the night had numbed her shoes, but still she kept running away from the home that no matter how many people were in it still felt empty away from the lonesome and fearful nights behind her, away from all the reminders of what she had had once but could never have again. But the truth of what she was running from, 
the feeling of darkness pushing in, the feeling of an endless night, and the fear that she'd never see the light again, was the only thing that had stayed with her. She pounded the ground, feeling the burning exhaustion in her legs that was nowhere near as bad as the wildfire in her heart. She ran to a quiet town which had just settled for the night. As she, as she ran, she saw the sleeping outlines of families together. She had to look down, burning tears blocking her vision. She peered through another window and saw the silhouettes of a mother, a daughter, and, and she kept running, kept moving forward through the dark, through the dark moonless night. She finally stopped at a pitch black midnight tower, twisted into the night, feeling as dark as her heart. She sat, finally letting the fiery hot tears spill down her face. She took out the golden locket that had never felt like hers since what had happened. She peered in at the picture of her mother, her, her father, and her all looking so happy. It had only been taken a little before what had happened. She'd tried to throw it away so many nights, but her arm wouldn't let her. She couldn't let go. <clears throat> she stared into the dark night, but it wasn't as dark of a night anymore. The stars and wisps of, wisps of light began, began to move through the sky she couldn't understand what was happening. She didn't understand what was happening. Bright explosions of light filled the, filled the sleepy town with joy and excitement. Even she had to, had to gasp wide-eyed, letting the beginnings of a smile creep onto her face for the first time in so, in so, in so long. Even in, the, even in the glowing sky, she she still in the glowing in the in the glowing sky she saw she, no it couldn't be but she did she saw him her father who she hadn't seen in so many months but felt like she saw every day and he smiled down at her somehow letting her know that even with he wasn't there with her everything would still be okay Great, thank you. That was really wonderful. Very beautiful. So let me talk a little bit about the plot, and then I want to say two things that I found to be interesting in the story. The story opens with a protagonist running through dark forest. Um, we're not totally sure what she is running away from. Uh, we're told that she's running away from her past, perhaps her memories, away from uh, the house that feels empty despite its population. She runs into a town so, so again, just notice the, the consequentiality between these events. Something has happened to her that she's running away from. So we already open in the middle of a consequential event. We don't know what the initiatory or the initial event is. We only see her running away from it. She runs into a town. She looks into windows. She observes other families. We have this weird poetic moment where you use the word and twice, but don't finish the sentence as a way of suggesting something which cannot be named. She runs out of the town and into a tower. It is only from this tower that she is able to gain a vantage point or a perspective to see the sky. From the tower, she sees uh, a vision. The stars move, the stars explode, and she is visited by the visage or the image of her father, whom now we understand she has lost. So, um, so you see how all those things are connected. One thing leads to another thing, leads to another thing, leads to another thing. She would not have had the vision of her father had she not ascended the tower. She would not have ascended the tower had she not seen something disturbing in town. We believe it was in hindsight a father figure. She would not have run into town had she not lost her father. You see, so there's all connections between all of the events. So two things that I noticed about the story that I liked independent of its plot. The first is the way that you withhold things from the reader uh, so that we get, so that we experience the kind of uh, the fear, 
the danger, uh, even the sadness of the protagonist without knowing why she is sad, what she is in danger of, um, or what she's running from. So you do a really wonderful thing with where you withhold information. You don't give everything to the reader right away. You let them experience the moment um, without, uh, without any kind of explanation for that feeling. The second thing you do is you create a really interesting connection between the narrators or the, excuse me, the protagonist's emotional state and the physical world outside of her. So the physical world is a kind of manifestation of her own psychological state where, um, you know, the, the darkness, uh, the shadows, uh, the density of, of the woods and the trees are all kind of physical manifestations of how she's feeling inside. So that, those are two really good things you do in the story, I think. Great job, yeah, thank you for sharing, it was wonderful. Okay, so next we have Emma. Okay, so um, I chose to write about um, the second painting, the one, no, uh, the one, Nighthawks. Oh, uh, well, yeah. So this is what I ended up with. I wondered why the cafe was getting colder. I looked outside the window and saw my answer. The shadows were closing in again. I'd been inside the cafe all day, the inside being warm and cozy compared to the icy frost outdoors. But then the shadows started coming closer. They had left after a while, but then the red woman came in. I didn't know her name. I named her the red woman because she wore red. She looked so beautiful, so pure, that no name seemed to fit her, even, even if I imagined her as someone else. She was sitting across from me with her husband, sipping coffee, unbothered by the shadows. And the shadows loved her. They avoided the toy shop and the clothes shop and the apartment buildings and the bakery. Last time they had haunted all those places. Not this time. They were running for the red woman, and even if shadows had no expression, I could still see their smiles of joy and absolute wonder and glee. If the shadows could make sound, they would have been laughing. And then they burst through the giant glass window of the cafe. They were surrounding the red woman, and the red woman was looking affected by the shadows for the first time. Her eyes were wide, and she was backing away slowly, slower and slower, panting like she couldn't catch her breath. And suddenly, it was like the shadows were human. They suddenly had long black fingers that they were pulling from their milky and dark insides. And they were grabbing the red woman. They were squeezing all the power out of her, all her beauty, and then they left. The red woman was sobbing, asking her husband to help her. But her husband ran away from the soiled lump of a woman on the ground. She looked at me like I, like I was her last resort, and I realized I was. We were alone in the cafe. As the red woman looked at me, her feet her features had already started to gray, her lips and nose already starting to twist and vanish. I realized that if I didn't do anything, she would be left to lead a life of brainless nothingness, a life of shadows and cold and ugliness. And then I said the first thing that came to my mind. Honey, I said, because that was what her face changing reminded me of, slowly dripping honey. Then I laughed because I realized how silly that word sounded coming out of my mouth in this situation but the red woman was smiling. She slowly melted away, her smile being the last thing, but I realized that she might, just might have been melting away to a world of warmth and kindness and honey. Wow, thank you, that's wonderful. That's very, um, that very poetic. I really love um, the, uh, what's really brilliant about that story is, will you just read maybe again for us the line, um, where the narrator says, honey, I said, just read that sentence again. Um, okay. Uh, honey, I said, because that was what her face changing reminded me of, slowly dripping honey. Yeah, it's really wonderful. It's very strange. Um, there's something that's simultaneously kind of horrifying and also very tender about that moment. So the way that that story works in terms of plot is really at the grammatical level. It's not so much at the level of event, um, but it happens in the language itself. So the narrator will often describe something and then proceed 
to tell us why she is describing things that way. She does it at least three times, most notably when she says, uh, she calls this figure the red woman and then says, I name her the red woman or I call her the red woman because she was wearing red, she was dressed in red, et cetera, et cetera. And then this again with the honey, honey, I said, because that's what I saw when I looked at her face, that's what her face reminded me of slowly dripping honey. So the relationship between uh, sentences in that story is a relationship of consequence. Uh, the narrator sees things and then names them according to her own perception. Um, so there is a kind of relationship between seeing and saying or seeing and writing that, that is really masterful. I think it's a very brilliant poetic way of writing. And I think once again, uh, like last week you've described a very uh, strange and evocative, also very magical scene. Um, it's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, next up is Olivia. The bike up the hill, a rather unusually strong breeze blowing. At the top, you have a good view of the whole place. The sandy stretch of feet the dark, unforgiving ocean, and the little island in the middle with the lake separating into two parts. Something catches your eye on that beach. No, it couldn't be. Still, you tighten the strength of the helmet and start sliding downhill faster. At the foot of the bridge that connected the beach and the island, you stop your bicycle and turn back. The thing isn't there anymore. You breathe a sigh of relief. You park your bike, unfasten your helmet, and hang it off the handles. You take a step onto the bridge. You see your hand on the railing, bathed in red, yellow, and orange light. You look up. The sky is made of a million waves of red and yellow. How strange. It is not yet afternoon, but it is too late for dawn. Your heart beats quickly. Out the corner of your eye, you see a shadow. You run, calling as your footsteps, right on the bridge. You can't scare me! You can't scare me! The people in front of you turn back to you, wearing sleepy, confused expression. You see a dark suit before you. you in the crowd of big fellow people, just in and out, moving through the snake. Oh no! A cold white hand grasps your shoulder, coming from behind you. Oh heaven, please help me, you pray. You turn around, gasping when you see it. It's fake. Stumbling a few steps backward, even though you had been warned about it. You try to run, but your feet are glued to the ground. Blackness closes around you, and you know you can do nothing about it. And that's the end. Uh, thank you, Olivia. That's really great. So something I have now noticed, I've heard you read now, I think three times, maybe more. I have noticed something that you are inclined to do in your stories that I, I love. Um, you have a very a uh, keen, attentive eye for describing landscapes. And your landscapes are, uh, they're vast. So you often describe them from high up or from down low looking up, but you have this kind of, um, this almost omniscient eye that describes landscapes that, that almost proliferate image by image. So your story begins by climbing up a hill. And then it is from the top of that hill that the story sees a vast and growing landscape, wind, trees, sky, a beach, an island, and a bridge. So this is how your story functions as a kind of plot. In order to have that vision, the hill must be climbed. You climb the hill, atop the hill, the, narr the, the, the narrator envisions this giant, vast landscape and locates a bridge. Then we descend, uh, you use the pronoun you. So we descend together down into the landscape. Um, 
there was a really wonderful line when we get to the bridge on the bicycle we get to the bridge and you say you're describing the sky the colors of the sky uh it's very evocative and then there's this line where you say it must be afternoon do you know do you know which line i'm talking about can you read that line again if you know where it is oh i think you're muted olivia Oh yeah, I think it's um it's not yet afternoon, but it is too late for dawn. Great, great, great. It's not yet afternoon, but it's too late for dawn. Uh, is my favorite line in the story because it situates us in this weird kind of in between space where we're neither in a in a landscape entirely real or imagined. We're almost in a in a kind of dream in between wakefulness and sleep. Um, and I think that's a good description of how your stories tend to be. It's kind of almost surreal, almost dreamlike descriptions of landscapes um, is really wonderful. And that's not to say anything about how strange the episodes of the bridge happen to be, the shadows passing by, uh, the cold hand that comes in at the story, and then the ambiguous fate of the protagonist of that story. It was really great. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, reading next will be Helen. I struggled to find it, um, but this is it. In a colorful land, there lived a non-colorful man. He stuck out like a sore thumb, and so he dreaded to go out in public. He tried to change himself, and his blank clothes became colorful clothes, and his blank life became a happy life. So life was good until one horrid night when all his colorful clothes were stolen, and his happy life, too. After that, he went back to his blank clothes and blank life and the dread of going to the grocery store. That's great. That's great. I really love it, especially that last line, because that last line is so specific. So throughout the whole story, throughout the narrative, you don't give much attention. You don't give much detail to the reader. So you even use uh, kind of um, uh, abstract phrases like a colorful world and a non-colorful man. So uh, we have these kind of vague, fuzzy images in our head, a colorful world and non color Are we supposed to understand that literally? Are we supposed to understand that metaphorically? Uh, and then at the end, he dreads going to the grocery store, which is this very hyper-specific detail that you give us at the end that is so, there's something so human about that moment. Um, it strikes me as a kind of turning point in the story. It's very, there's something very powerful. It's very subtle, but it's very powerful. And, um, and I think strangely moving, he dreaded going to the grocery store. Okay, so that's what I loved most about that story is that last line, which is very memorable and striking. Um, but you also give us a very quick, uh, almost kind of flash fiction type of plot you, you, it's a very condensed plot, and it's a very tight, well-connected plot. A man is not fitting in around him. You, you use this kind of metaphorical, figurative language. He doesn't fit in because he is not the same color as the rest of the world. So this is kind of metaphorical description of alienation, of loneliness, uh, of, of social separation, maybe of anxiety. He goes out into the world and he tries to change himself. He tries to change his life. He buys clothes. He does things that other people do. Uh, and then his clothes are stolen. And of course he loses all of his confidence. He's once again alienated. And we see him at the end of the story, dreading going to the grocery store. Okay, the, uh, it's, really, it's really beautiful, I think, because it is so figurative. Um, it operates as a kind of universal narrative in some ways. Uh, a narrative that could be applied to so many different kinds of emotional and psychological situations, uh, not to mention social ones. Um, and th yeah, there's something in that figu figuration that I find to be very poetic. There's also a kind of weird connection in the story between happiness and clothing. Uh, so there is uh, something about the story that seems to want to make a commentary on the relationship between those two things. And that's kind of funny. There's, there's something almost funny about that, that this man who is unhappy thinks he can find happiness in his clothing. So it seems inevitable in the story that that happiness isn't going to last, that it's a superficial happiness, a short-lived happiness. And then of course, 
he dreads going to the grocery store. It's really wonderful. I think it was outstanding. Um, uh, again, it didn't seem at all uh, a, a kind of struggle for you to write. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I loved your first sentence as well. I thought it was a terrific opening line and very succinct. Um, so finishing us off for today will be Harina. And I was halfway through the forest. The sun's hot rays flashed on my face. Compared to the tall, thick oak trees, I was a tiny mouse. I bravely walked through the apple green colored wines. I couldn't take the heat anymore, but I was trying to be courageous. The guy bluff was no longer behind my back. I started to blush. I felt like I was watched, but knew that wasn't true. I began to panic. I had no guide and was lost in an unknown jungle spot, not knowing where to go. Just then, nearby a tall logan tree was a green bush with ripened berries. On top, I noticed the starry sky painting. With shaking hands, I lifted the painting up, and behind was a note that read, Dear Lily, it's me, your guide, Bluff. Don't panic or anything, but I'm stuck in the painting. Yours truly, Bluff. I was speechless. How could this have happened? Did he do this on purpose or what? That was wonderful. Thanks for sharing. So that that seems like the the very beginning of what could be a, um, a, a grand plot. Um, so you used some techniques from last week as well, um, which I love to see. Uh, I love to see that kind of continuation, continuing the things that you've been learning throughout. Uh, so you began, as we say, in media res, which means that you began in the middle, in the very middle of, of some kind of conflict, uh, in the middle of, of some kind of crisis. Like Dante's Divine Comedy, your protagonist begins in the middle, halfway, you say, and halfway through the forest. So it's very reminiscent of Dante's great long poem, The Inferno, the beginning of the Divine Comedy. And then we are introduced to a, a, a narrator, a protagonist who is lost, who is wandering. Uh, she seems to wander around for a little while and then, uh, and then discovers that her guide is trapped in a painting. Uh, so this, again, you use not only the elements of and from last week, but the elements of plot from this week. Uh, um, a character is lost, a character is searching, a character finds a clue that is going to help her um, resolve her situation, find herself or find her way out of the forest. So you have what seems to me the beginning of some kind of great fantastical epic. It's really wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing. And, and thank you also for, for continuing to use some of the tools that we talked about last week. It's really great. Thank you. I also loved, yeah, I just want to say one more thing. I loved the contrast between the landscape, which is gigantic, and the protagonist, who is very small by comparison. So there's this almost imagistic representation of being lost or feeling lost. The landscape is huge. The protagonist is very small and cannot see. It's great. Thank you. All right, so I think that's all, right, Caleb? Is there anyone else? Yeah, no, that's it. Great, so thank all of you for reading and for participating in the discussion. Um, I love to hear all of your work and I look forward to seeing you next week. Um, don't forget to submit your stories and your poems uh, to the link that Caleb provided in the chat. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to stay afterwards and, and you can ask them, we can chat. Otherwise, you're free to go. Thanks for coming and I'll see you next week.